Morning, Doctor. Yeah, um, sorry for the delay. Um, so we're going to we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about uh, obstet obstetric uh, anesthesia. Uh, it's quite a, a long lecture, but I'm going to talk about uh, the most important things. Um, from the last time we met, um, I think two weeks ago, we talked about um, um, autonomic nervous system and and the drugs that are involved. Yes, uh, I. Just want to recap that there's uh, a question that was asked uh, last time but uh, that I did not answer, but I, I tried to do some research and first understand what is behind it. Uh, when I was talking about autonomic nervous system and its effect on the urinary bladder. So we talked about uh, um, when someone has sympathetic activation, that is the fight and flight mode, uh, you have uh, the patient retains urine. And the question was, why is it that many people when they are, when, when they are afraid they pass urine? Now, the thing is that um, the autonomic nervous system co controls uh, the dextrusor muscle, which is responsible for contraction and then re release of, um, of urine. But it works in uh, hand in hand with the internal sphincter, which is also con is under autonomic nervous system control. When you have the sympathetic activation, you have uh, uh, you have a uh, constriction of the ureth internal urethral sphincter and relaxation of the the, the the muscle. When you have parasympathetic activation, you have uh, relaxation of the internal sphincter, and then you have uh, uh, contraction of the the. the the trusta muscle. This is all under autonomic nervous system control. But the external sphincter is actually not under autonomic nervous system control. The external sphincter is under uh, is under control of the of the frontal lobe. Okay, so the frontal lobe is the one uh, whereby, uh, regardless of your sympathetic activation, when the frontal lobe says that uh, you have to pass urine, it will just open the external sphincter and you'll open the urine. Now, during times of flight and uh, uh, of fight and flight, um, the limbic the limbic seat system overrides the, the frontal cortex. The limbic system is the one that is responsible for controlling emotion and fear. So when it's activated, it overrides the, the frontal cortex and then uh, there's a relaxation of the external urethral sphincter and urine can be passed in some cases. Okay, I think that one fixes it. Uh, let's talk about obstetric anesthesia. Now, obstetric anesthesia is um, is very interesting. Now, as um, when you become doctors, which is very soon, you realize that uh, you come across obstetrics a lot in your practice. Okay, and of course, uh, you need to have an idea on obstetric anesthesia. Now, during childbirth, the woman usually requires care in uh, in three main areas. That is analgesia, which is still lacking in our setting. But uh, um, pain during uh, labor is actually very high pain. Uh, people have rated it at about 10 out of 10, uh, which is uh, very high. It is one of the most painful things that someone can experience. So we should respect our mothers who went through such a um, a terrible experience to make sure that we are alive. So, but analgesia uh, is um, analgesia is really required for labor, especially now in the new era. Now that uh, medicine has advanced, there's no reason why someone should be in pain uh, when they're in labor. Okay. So, also anesthesia is usually required uh, in terms of when they are going to do cesarean section. And believe me or not, even when you want to do vacuum extraction and forcep, you need. Uh, uh, you need someone to be under an anesthesia. And of course, managing critical ill patients, people with uh, eclampsia, preeclampsia, uh, PPH. Uh, uh, 
uh, for obstetrical anesthesia uh, uh, involves uh, so many people, including the obstetrician, midwife, and uh, the physicians, uh, not the, only the anesthesiologist. Now, just briefly to recap about maternal physiology. Um, now, I have to say that when we talk about maternal physiology, progesterone is responsible for most of the things that are uh, that are that are happening. Okay. Or when we talk about obstetric anesthesia and the changes that are happening uh, uh, during um, uh, the changes that are happening during uh, pregnancy are all because of progesterone. Okay, and uh, of course, progesterone is in in pregnancy is mainly produced by the placenta, and one of the main function main functions of progesterone is relaxation of the smooth mu smooth muscle as the body is is uh, trying to adjust for ultimate delivery okay but all the other physiology all the physiological changes that are happening are because of progesterone um, as you may already know that uh, plasma volume increases by 50 percent and uh, the blood volume increases um, by uh, uh, up to 80 to 85 the body is preparing itself to lose a uh, volume during delivery so uh, there is increase in uh, in blood uh, in blood volume then the red cell also increases by about 30%, but the increase in uh, plasma volume is greater than the increase in, uh, in red cell volume. So the end result is that the patient gets what we call dilution or anemia of pregnancy, okay? Um, so then also cardiac output increases by about 50%, uh, as you can see um, from the notes. So the cardiac output is increasing because you want to increase the hemodynamic saturation so that um, the baby can get enough perfusion, the fetus can get enough perfusion and, and grow very well. Remember, if uh, there's no good supply to the placenta, the patient will get intrauterine and growth restriction, which, uh, which uh, is not good, okay? Another thing to note is that during labor, cardiac output also further increases. So imagine now you already have 50% increase because of the, the physiology, the physiological change during pregnancy, and then during labor, the cardiac output increases about 40%. And uh, this is bad if, for example, someone has a heart problem, okay? If maybe he has uh, uh, type one um, in pregnancy, it can move to type two and uh, and at delivery, it can go to four because at delivery, uh, there is maternal transfusion because of the contracting uterus. So there is body transfusion, natural transfusion, because all the blood that has been in the uterus uh, will go back into the body. blood pressure. And uh, the reason why, uh, sorry, the, the what decreases, the diastolic pressure decreases, uh, but this, the systolic pressure does not increase much. So um, one of the things we think about is the, the compression of the iota and the inferior vena cava. But of, of course, the iota is an artery. It is not compressible, but the vena cava is compressible. So because it is uh, much more compressed, compressible in spine position, there is decreased venous return, impaired cardiac output. Decreased venous return means decrease in diastolic blood pressure, okay? In change in systemic vascular, uh, in systemic vascular resistance will cause changes in systolic, a uh, change in, in uh, preload or venous return will always change the diastolic. Then there will be decrease in diastolic blood pressure. Okay, uh, so of course, um, there is relaxation of the anterior and venous capacity. This is all progesterone. I said progesterone uh, is the main uh, hormone. So if they ever ask you a question uh, concerning physiological changes of pregnancy and you don't know what is causing it, you just say progesterone is because of progesterone effect. But eventually it's a, it's a muscle relax. It's a relaxant, smooth muscle relax, relaxant, smooth muscle relaxant, very important, um, and uh, 
and these different changes. Okay. Um, uh, one of also the very important things that you need to know is the changes in clotting. So generally, someone who is um, uh, someone who is um, who is pregnant is in a hypercoagulable state, of course, uh, and this is very important for the hemostasis of the placenta. Uh, after separation and during the third stage of labor, this one the body is naturally preparing itself to avoid the patient getting a getting PPH. Okay. Um, the respiratory changes. Um, the most important change is the alveolar hyperventilation. Okay. And uh, the increase, so because there's increase in tidal volume and the patient is hyperventilating, is blowing out carbon dioxide, um, the patient gets into, they have, uh, um, pregnant mothers have respiratory alkalosis, okay? So this is very important because uh, um, because of hyperventilation, increase in tidal volume, consumption, oxygen consumption has increased. Um, if you're going to do general anesthesia and uh, you you are pre-oxygenating them, they can desaturate, so they need to be really properly pre-oxygenated or denitrified. Um, you hear us talk about pre-oxygenation much more when you do your actual rotation and see anesthesia being performed, okay? Uh, of course, um, because of uh, increase in the 2,3 DPG, uh, and uh, of course also high, P high pH, uh, then the oxygen dissociation curve will be shifted to to the right, okay? And also the fact that uh, during pregnancy, the breasts are solid and engorged, uh, which can also put a risk of difficult intubation. Um, I think you, when you, when you start about, uh, I think you've started about preoperative um, assessment. So you know what we mean when we talk about uh, uh, difficult intubation, okay? Um, Gastrointestinal changes, there's decrease in lower oesophageal sphincter pressure. This one, uh, most of the mothers, I think some of you, if you have had a, uh, a baby or you've had someone, or maybe your wife or girlfriend has had a, a child, you know this problem of heartburn is a big problem, especially as you increase in, um, in the days, uh, 35, 36, 37, those weeks they, but the reason is also still because of progesterone. As I said, it's a smooth muscle uh, relaxant. So this results into decrease in GI motility. They have this decreased gastric emptying and uh, usually, uh, um, so they are at risk. Now, th this one comes in play if you're going to do an elective surgery. If you're going to give an elective surgery, you have to give accountability for this. You have to give drugs that will prevent the patient from uh, um, uh, uh, having issues because of the dis so you have to give a drug that will increase gastric uh, emptying okay and you will see us being this when you see us being elective assesian sections okay so i've already mentioned here antacids now you uh antacids uh uh are good, and I know here in the notes, uh, I think uh, there was a mistake here, but uh, um, you can give sodium citrate, uh, H2 antagonists you can give, but actually um, protein pump inhibitors are, are much more preferred these days to, to H2 antagonists, okay? Because for them, they work uh, straight away on the hydrogen potassium at base pump and um, uh, so they can effectively decrease uh, acid secretion. Of course, even metal copromide, sometimes we also add it to, quick, to quicken the gastric emptying, emptying or to counteract the effect of progesterone on, on the gastric emptying as part of the physiological process of, uh, of pregnancy. Uh, CNS changes, um, I would say that um, the mark, they, there's increased sensitivity to nervous system, both general anesthesia and local anesthesia. So actually, you may realize that the dose when we're doing spine anesthesia will always be low in cesarean section, okay, than uh, compared to gynecolo other gynecological cases. So patients who are pregnant, uh, they require less of the local anesthetic and also general anesthetic, including the mark, the mean arterial. Uh, uh, the, mean, the minimum alveolar concentration of the inhalational agent, uh, which I think uh, 
you have talked about it or you're going to talk about it when you talk about inhalation or agents. Um, we have um, the different types of local and regional anesthesia. I'm going to just allow me to just skip this uh, because I think you have, um, you really have uh, a lecture on local anesthesia, so I'm not going to preempt this. So um, we want to talk about the pain pathways in labor. Now, uh, if you have noticed, if you when you did your rotation on maternity ward, uh, you must have noticed that uh, when women are in labor, or if you have been, if you have had labor before, or you know someone who has been in labor, you must have noticed that um, during the first stage labor, if they don't have any form of analgesia on board, they usually they are holding their their backs, okay, and uh, this makes sense because uh, uh, in the first stage of labor. Okay, when uh, usually the in the first step, both the latent and the active uh, phase of labor, the fa active first stage of labor, um, there's uh, there's what is causing pain is because of the, the contractions that are happening and distending the uh, the innervation uh, uh, around around the uterus and also the cervix is dilating. So during dilatation. Um, they are receiving uh, um, the they, they are the nerve roots come from about ten T ten to L one okay so that's why you see them holding the back uh, during the second stage because uh, in the second stage what is happening this this session of the back canal uh, and also um, so the most predominant um, uh, what is happening now is that the pudendal nerve is uh, uh, is being uh, Pressed and pudendal nerve has its root from S to S3, S4. And that's why um, uh, before anesthesiologists used to like uh, doing uh, pudendal nerve blocks, and uh, pudendal nerve blocks would only help uh, during the second stage of labor because they would, uh, because the pudendal nerve block has its nerve root from S to S3, S4, then it comes and joins together. Uh, it joins together and you can get to the point where the video don't have joins together and you give local anesthetic and it's very good effective analgesia. Of course, this has gone out of play because of uh, the coming up of epidurals, which are much more superior than doing uh, parasitical and video don't have blocks. Um, so uh, this is just history. Let me just uh, skip it. It's not uh, important for you. Now, uh, pain, uh, when labor is painful, uh, it usually stresses a, a mother so much, okay? And because of uh, the pain, of course, there's increase in catecholamine secretion, um, there's increase in myocardial work and BP, and this uh, can cause, can compromise blood flow to the placenta and vasoconstriction. So if a mother, for example, is in fetal distress, them being in pain is actually a disadvantage to them because of uh, of, uh, of exactly what I've ju just said. Um, so uh, when you when you give an effective analgesia, uh, you block this this stress response and reverse the adverse effects of labor. So what I'm trying to say is that um, when a patient is in labor, they're increasing catecholamines, increasing cardiac, uh, increasing myocardial work, uh, then causing vasoconstriction. So it affects both uh, the maternal well-being and also the placenta perfusion. So it is not good to have people in labor, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, not in labor, people in uh, having labor pains. So um, the ideal um, the ideal analgesic that we are using now is the, the use of uh, an epidural, epidural technique. Though also low dose, low dose uh, single single shot spinal can also be used, but I'll not go yeah uh, uh, in detail because this is, may not be uh, uh, relevant for you. So in other in other words, there are two different types of labor analgesias. We have the non pharmacological and then the pharmacological. Okay, the non pharmacological is probably the most commonly used in our setting whereby uh, um, they do psychoprophylaxis. They prepare your mind, okay? Uh, and tell you not to be afraid and ETC. Some people do it by sending the mother-in-law to, 
to be there so that you can be more brave uh, during the, the whole experience, okay? But trust me, uh, I have seen labor pain firsthand on people, not on me, but uh, on, uh, on my wife, and it's not, it was not good, at least for the first delivery, okay? Fortunately, other deliveries, she did, she, she underwent labor analgesia, and uh, she, she can tell you of the difference. Uh, also, hypnosis, I, uh, this one, I have no experience in it. Perhaps he, if someone else has experience on it, he can tell you. Uh, transcutaneous electric nerve simulation is also something that can be used. Um, and uh, it is, uh, this one, we mostly use it in patients with chronic back pain, but we can also use it on uh, in pregnancy. Eh? Uh, here, it involves putting pads on, uh, on the lower back in the region of T10. Yeah, um, L1, that's where the pain receptors are for uh, during the first stage of labor. And then, um, uh, then of course, there's release of endorphins, which can, uh, uh, endorphins are the pain receptors. They work on the mu receptor and uh, can have analgesic effect. Uh, acupuncture can also be used, but um, of course, research that has been done, it was ineffective in about 80% of cases, only 20%. Uh, reported improvement. So uh, uh, it, I think it may have little or no effect. Systemic analgesia, uh, believe me or not, you can give uh, fentanyl, ketamine, ETC for analgesia. But uh, the, of course, you have to consider other, other issues with doing this. Um, so Nitrous oxide, uh, I think you must have talked about it when you talked about inhalational agents. Nitrous oxide is a very, very, uh, very effective drug. Um, uh, it ha it's the only inhalation agent that has analgesic property, okay? The way it works is, uh, is not clear, but um, as you know, as most of these inhalational drugs, uh, it is reported to have some effect on GABA receptor and also other Reeves receptors. But it's another. But it's a good analgesic, and it has a rapid onset. Um, it's very good. Uh, I think it was the first uh, in. Uh, it, it was the first labor analgesia to be used. Now the regional. Uh, what we mostly use for labor is a, we can use epidural spinal or combined spinal epidural, or what we call single shot spinal. Okay, for epidural, this is the most effective. Analgesic, analgesic for labor. So if you need labor analgesia, this would be, I think, your preferred option. Um, it has an effectiveness which is greater than 90%. What I'm saying greater than 90% is that mothers report almost no pain uh, uh, with an epidural anal analgesia. The only challenge is that it requires careful monitoring until the mother delivers, okay? Um, in our setting, the I beg your pardon. So, um, the biggest contraindication um, uh, is if the mother refuses epidural analgesia. Okay, and this is this is a common thing because. Uh, mm, uh, at least I've had a mother tell me I cannot do epidural because uh, God was, well, when he said, he said a woman should feel labor duty, should feel pain during labor, okay? So, yeah, so, but anyway, maternal refusal is one of the contraindications. Of course, coagulopathy, sepsis, septicemia, and of course also uh, one of the things that is happening, why you don't see epidurals being done a lot is because of, uh, few available people to do the epidural, okay? But of course, when you finish medical school and internship, you come and do anesthesia. So we'll have more people. So epidurals will be done on more mothers. Um, so this one is just showing us, uh, uh, this one, I think, let me just skip it. I don't think, um, so this, this table is just showing us uh, the indications of a, an epidural. If a mother requests it, um, maybe one thing to say is that uh, epidural is is usually required if a patient has a cardiac disease, okay? Because during the labor pain can cause increase in catecholamines, 
cause vessel constriction, ETC, stress the heart. So usually if some a mother is known to have a cardiac issue, we shall put an epidural as a matter of, the, of urgency so that they do not feel any pain and then they do not have a worsening of their cardiac symptoms during labor, okay? Uh, very important. Um, so um, there are many things you need to do. Uh, there are two ways of, uh, uh, three ways of, uh, of giving uh, the epidural, okay? Uh, you can give repeated boluses. Uh, so you can give repeated boluses or you can put an infusion and put them on a syringe pump. And now what is becoming more famous is using patient controlled epidural analgesia, whereby uh, the patient, when he needs painkillers, just presses uh, a button and, and, uh, and the pain uh, treatment is administered. And you can do it even for an epidural, okay? Um, when you're doing a uh, regional anesthesia, um, so you can, we can do uh, regional anesthesia also for CCN section, and uh, the most commonly performed is, uh, is spinal anesthesia. Um, maybe to mention that I said single shot spinal, but I did explain it. Single shot spinal is also doing a spinal and you give a uh, low dose of the local anesthetic with uh, some of the additives like uh, fentanyl, but preferably morphine. Um, and you give a single shot and the patient will have less pain for the next uh, uh, six to eight hours during labor. So their pain score will be very low and they will deliver with less pain. Uh, so um, regional, now you probably you will have a chance to do a spinal anesthesia uh, during uh, uh, during your rotation, okay? Uh, a few years ago, uh, most of the patients who were having elective or emergency cesarean section, we are done uh, we are done cesarean section under ketamine or general anesthesia, but uh, this has gone out of fashion. It's really uh, the mortality is very high on using ketamine and uh, very bad uh, increases hospital stay and etc. Uh, so it's, it's completely uh, um, not acceptable now, unless there's an indication for you to do general anesthesia uh, in a patient who is undergoing cesarean section. So the most important choice that you make will be spinal anesthesia, okay? Um, now, spinal anesthesia, uh, let me see. So these are, these are the indications of spinal anesthesia, but um, I will just skip the and and just talk about... Um, uh, so well, what happens during spinal anesthesia? When you do spinal anesthesia, you, the local anesthetic is put in the subarachnoid space. Let me see if I have a picture of the subarachnoid space. No, no, it's okay. So it's put in the subarachnoid space and uh, it moves uh, uh, through the CSF to the spinal cords and the nerve roots and then uh, it causes effect of the local anesthetic, okay? Um, there are two types of needles that we use. We have what we call the pencil point needles, and then we have the cutting needles. Now, currently we have cutting needles, which are the quickie needles, but uh, they prefer the pencil point needles because the pencil point needles, um, they have um, they have less chance of uh, cutting through tissue and poking holes into the epidural space, and uh, that's decreased the uh, you are less likely to get a, a spinal headache when you use a, a pencil point needle versus a cutting needle. And this is a common question that is usually asked um, from undergraduates. Um, the advantage of pencil point needle versus a cutting needle. So you need to know that pencil point needle is preferred. Uh, it's important for you to know which one is, um, uh, which which one is pencil point and which one is uh, is cutting needle, okay? Mm. Uh, so um, so there's uh, so sorry for that. Um, 
So uh, this is showing us the it, it, this is showing us the spinal, um, the pointed and um, the cutting needles. Um, the things that influence the how high the the spinal cord is usually the site of injection, the shape of the spinal cord, the patient height, the angulation of the needle. Uh, you know, so these things um, uh, you'll understand them better when you actually do your rotation and you actually do a spinal, okay? Maybe something also to note is that uh, you'll be asked on the ward, um, the layers that are pa passed through when you're going to do a spinal anesthesia. It's usually the skin, subcutaneous, supraspinous, interspinous, ligamentum flavum, which is a very tough tissue. And uh, when you're doing a spinal epidural, it's the one that tells you that, uh, uh, that you've uh, reached the epidural space. And then the, uh, if you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing uh, if you're doing a spinal, then it's going to this is this is where uh, it's going to, it's going to go in the subarachnoid space. Okay, so this is just a three dimensional showing the lumbar spinal column and the epidural space. Um, so you can see uh, uh, you can see this is this is this is the subarachnoid uh space okay and there is already csf and now foots in okay we always go uh, below or l2 because the spinal cord ends below l2 and l1 and and sense of now foots after that okay so this is just a picture of someone doing a, uh, a spinal and uh, this one you'll be more familiar with it um, when you do your rotation of spinal Okay, so let's see. Maybe the issues with spinal is that uh, uh, whenever you do a spinal, uh, the first thing that is is usually uh, blocked is the it's it moves in a progressive um, uh, order. Okay, but when this when the sensor is blocked, you can always uh, use a pin prick or you can use an alcohol swab um, to detect this. Okay. Um, maybe another thing to say is that um, uh, the commonest uh, occurrence in spinal anesthesia will be hypotension. And uh, in, in obstetrics or in pregnancy, there are three main reasons why someone gets uh, a hypotensive, okay? Uh, the, the first thing is that, um, as you know, that uh, blood pressure is, uh, uh, is cardiac, it has, it has cardiac output and systemic uh, vascular resistance involved, and the cardiac output is actually uh, it involves a uh, stroke volume, stroke volume which is related to the preload. Okay, so uh, during spinal, because of sympathetic, it blocks sympathetic activation of the lower limbs, so there is uh, extensive parasympathetic and opposed parasympathetic stimulation and vessel uh, dilatation. The vessel dilatation means that there's decrease in. Uh, in uh, in preload decreased venous return which means decreased uh, preload and then also yeah, change in systemic vascular resistance which decreases the systemic vascular re resistance and also can decrease blood pressure and of course uh, there's also uh, compression of the inferior vena cava remember the inferior vena cava runs on the right side of the iota so you you have to place the patient in the left lateral position so that there's no compression of the inferior vena cava. Inferior, compression of inferior vena cava will mean reduced venous return and also uh, it will mean uh, decreased uh, blood pressure. Um, so it's important to know that uh, when you're putting mothers, you put them in the left lateral position, not in the right lateral position, you put them in left uh, lateral position, okay? Um, so how do we manage this? We usually manage it by uh, um, increasing the preload. So you can use a crystalloid uh, preload. You can give crystalloids, normal saline, ringers, lactate, um, or you can use pharmacology, okay? Ephedrine is more effective than phenyl -ephrine. Now, remember we talked about ephedrine and phenyl uh, during in our first lecture when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, we said ephedrine is an alpha one. It works on alpha one and beta one receptors. Alpha one is uh, most important for vasoconstriction. So when you want to increase blood pressure, you can increase 
vasoconstrictor, you can give a vasoconstrictor like ephedrine, okay? It also has effect on beta one, so it can increase the heart rate. But we say that the problem it has is tachyphylaxis. The more you give it, the more ineffective it becomes because how it works is that it indirectly uh, causes norepinephrine to be released in the, uh, in the synaptic cleft and then attaches itself on the postsynaptic cleft. So when norepinephrine uh, resources are exhausted, then uh, also the effect of ephedrine gets exhausted. Phenylephrine, we said, was predominantly alpha-1 receptor, but it has a challenge of causing bradycardia. So that's why uh, ephedrine is, uh, is more effective than uh, phenylephrine, but they're all vasoconstrictors. Uh, you'll see us be using uh, uh, adrenaline to also increase blood pressure, but we only use it because we are stuck. But when ephedrine is there, we, then we use ephedrine first. Okay. Uh, high spinal, high spinal is a, is a serious complication, uh, and here they, you get paralysis of the abdominal muscle because the spinal has blocked in any area above T4. Any area blocked above T4 is considered high spinal because we don't want the spinal to go beyond T4 because the sympathetic supply of the heart is T1 and T4. So if you get sympathetic uh, blockage, then you're going to get bradycardia and then you're going to get issues. So anything above T4 is high spinal. So uh, of course, uh, total spinal will be blockage of the entire spinal cord, including the brain stem. This one is bad and it causes loss of consciousness and profound uh, a low and bad hypotension. Now, it's important to know that there's a difference between high spinal and uh, a, there's a difference between high spinal and uh, and severe hypotension. So you can give spinal and someone gets severe hypotension. In that case, you need to give us oppressors. So you have to know, has he got high spinal or has he got uh, hypotension? So I've often seen uh, someone gets uh, changes condition and the first reaction is that someone puts a tube but if someone has severe hypertension if you put a, a and if you intubate the person you're not going to help them no okay if he has a high spinal the first thing is you should intubate if he doesn't have a high spinal the first thing is to give the vasopressor okay uh, this one you become more familiar with it when you when you uh, uh, you become more familiar with it when you when you do um, um, your rotation. Uh, just uh, just give me a moment. All right, um, just had a small emergency. Now, so uh, this, the, the things that are required during spinal uh, are very important, but probably this will make more sense when you do your rotation um, and uh, you will see how all this is done. But monitoring is very vital, especially the pass oximeter. Um, depending on, on the clinical picture, you may need to give crystalloids. Okay, and then of course have vasopressors to use them when you need them. And every time you prepare for spinal, you have to prepare for GA because you may need to intubate him at some point. Okay. Um, I think this one you become more familiar with it. So we've already discussed it. Um, uh, we've already discussed this. Uh, remember some of the complications of spinal anesthesia is if you fail to do the block. Uh, back pain has been reported in many in many people who have uh, a spinal anesthesia. Of course, also spinal headache is something that is very common. If you have a larger needle, it is not good. I've often heard of horror stories where people use cannulas to do spinal, which is really very crude and uh, inappropriate. Um, so the recommended size should be gauge 25 and, uh, and gauge 27. Preferably, the smaller the size, the better. Okay, um, so if someone gets a spinal headache, the treatment is, uh, is bed rest and simple analgesia. And the spinal headache um, um, uh, it has a specific, someone is asking a question. Yes, yes, Robert. 
Yes, good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, my question was still about spinal headache. I don't know whether you are going to even explain it to me. But okay. uh, I've seen women uh, continuing with this spinal headache even up to two weeks. So yes. I'm wondering, uh, how, what's the real mechanism of this spinal headache? OK. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very that's a very very good question okay there, now the spinal headache what is happening is that uh when you're doing spinal uh, remember we talked about uh, the layers that you go through skin subcutaneous uh, supraspinous interspinous then you have um uh so you have um, you go through the ligamentum flavor and then epidural space and then you go to subarachnoid so before you go to subarachnoid you go through the dura so every time you do spinal and you puncture the dura, okay, the CSF can leak from the dura, especially if you have a big needle. So when the CSF uh, leaks, then, then you have uh, less of the what? Uh, less of, of CSF. So that means that if a person is in a supine position, they will not report any headache. When they sit up, the headache will increase. That's a characteristic. If you want to shed the headache of spinal from other spinals, it has a characteristic when a patient lies down the, the headache goes. When he sits up, the headache comes. Okay. Now we treat it by allowing the patient to have some bed rest. And uh, you can even you give panadol and fluids. Uh, if it doesn't work, caffeine has been shown to be effective in treating that spinal headache. But if it continues. Uh, then you have to do an epidural blood patch. An epidural blood patch, how you do it is that uh, you, uh, you, you get the patient's own blood and you put it in the epidural space uh, uh, to cause uh, some clotting and also to seal the hole, wherever the hole might be, uh, where CSF is leaking. Okay? It's a very distressing, um, it's a very distressing for uh, it's very distressing for mothers when they undergo this. So the best thing is that we use smaller needle size, gauge 25 to 27 to decrease the, um, uh, the risk and also to use uh, pencil point needles uh, instead of the cutting needles. Okay. Now, um, so we talked about the complication, hypotension, uh, spinal headache. Spinal hematoma is a very bad complication and it's an emergency. Okay. Um, so when someone gets a spinal hematoma, uh, it's an emergency because they will need to be operated and uh, that spinal, you need spinal surgery to remove that hematoma. It's an emergency. If it's not done within 12 hours, the patient will be permanently paralyzed. Okay. Of course, you can also have um, meningitis abscess formation, all those things can happen um, under spine, okay? Um, of course, the contraindication is if the patient refuses, if there's infection, uh, co coagulopathies, uh, if someone has a platelet of uh, less than, it's less than 80,000, okay? But you can actually still do above 80,000. But, but if someone, for example, has pre here, and uh, platelets are low, uh, it's a very re big risk for you to do spinal. And of course, if someone has severe hypovolemia, uh, okay, raised intracranial pressure and uh, aortic and mitral stenosis, okay? Because in mitral stenosis, you need to increase the preload. Uh, uh, so you need the preload increased and also aortic stenosis. So, um, so spinal decreases the preload, so it will not be a good option. Okay. I think I think we shall not talk about the epidural. Maybe just to show you that uh, from this screen you can see uh, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, the ligamentum flavum, which is a tough tissue. Then this is the epidural space. This is where you put the catheter if you're doing an epidural, and then this is the subarachnoid space. Uh, these are the nerve roots that are there. This is any point, this is anatomy at any point below L2 in an adult. Okay. I think, um, I think we are done with, uh, uh, so I've already explained the blood patch. 
Okay, now I want to ask, do we have any questions? There are some questions in the chat, doctor. Yes, well, on the chat. Eh? Yes. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Um, and uh, what's this? Uh, an example of a condition where general is required. Okay, so someone asked, what, what is an example? Give me an example of a condition where general anesthesia is required for cesarean section. Um, yes, the example I would give you is if a patient has preeclampsia, um, preeclampsia is when someone has raised blood pressure after 20 weeks of uh, gestation and then have a uh, high, they have proteinuria and um, other things. So if, if um, and they have not had any seizure. So if someone has a uh, preeclampsia, uh, usually when you do their platelets and you find them that are less than um, 80,000, that's a contraindication of uh, doing a spinal. So you cannot do a, a spinal there, you have to do general anesthesia. Also, in maybe in other cases where uh, a patient has a severe hypotension, of course, spinal causes hypotension, you can't do uh, you can't do spinal. So there are conditions where general anesthesia will be required. Of course, even when the patient refuses, as I already mentioned before. Uh, why is there pre Why is there sympathetic blockage specifically? Yes, that's a very good question. Remember when we were talking about the anatomy of the sympathetic system, we, sympathetic nervous system, we said the sympathetic has nerve roots in the thoracolumbar, okay? So when you're giving spinal, you're blocking nerve roots, which are sympathetic nerve roots. Remember, when you remember the nerve roots, you have sympathetic roots, motor and sensory roots coming out of the spinal cord. So it means that uh, you're blocking uh, everything sympathetic, motor and, uh, and sensory uh, innovation. So yeah, there will be sympathetic blockage because it's sympathetic is thoracolumbar. Uh, what is the science behind telling the patient to cough during spinal anesthesia? I think probably the reason why people do it is because uh, um, they want to increase uh, uh, pr intracranial pressure, maybe to just, I don't know, they, but it's not necessary to tell the patient to cough. What in theater with, uh, are not, uh, it's not uh, necessary during spinal anesthesia to tell the patient uh, to cough. But when you, of course, when the patient coughs, maybe uh, they think that the spinal will spread much faster, but it's not necessary to tell the patient to cough. In theater with breakups are not even accepted. Blood pressure are fast stabilized. Um, in theater, patients with preeclampsia, I, I say it depends on the clinical situation. Okay. Uh, what explains the feeling of coldness in most women after cesarean section following spinal um, anesthesia? Okay. So heat loss happens in, in very many reasons, but the main reason why people feel cold is. Uh, the fluids, the fluids that are given are usually cold. I think they're lower than the body temperature. Uh, you know, during cesarean section, uh, sometimes a lot of fluids are given. I think it, it explains the coldness. And uh, as you may have already seen, you can treat it by giving 20 milligrams of uh, pethidine. Pethidine uh, decreases the, uh, increases the shivering threshold. So it's a very good treatment for this shivering and coldness, okay? During the during spine. Doctor, you skipped two questions. Which question? Uh, yes. From Marseille, which modalities are blocked in epidural anesthesia? Is it motor? Is motor spared? And how does one push? Uh, yeah. Oh, that, that, that is that is. Oh, I had not seen those questions. Um, that's that's a good, a very good question. Which modalities are blocked in epidural and motor spared? How does one? So um, that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, so when you we usually give it in the epidural space, and uh, you can have uh, um, during epidural motor is not blocked; it is only sensory that is blocked. 
okay? So uh, motor is spared. So if someone has an epidural on board, they're able to walk. They're able to do everything. It does not even block the contractions, but it only takes away the pain of the contractions. So you block the pain receptors, so there's no sensory, uh, there's no sensory receptor. So the motor should be spared. The patient should be able to walk around, do everything that they need to do uh, because only sensory will be blocked. But the contractions will be there, but they will not be painful. They will only feel like a tightness in the abdomen or they will feel something hard in their, or in their abdomen, but uh, they will not be in pain. Is there a special or catheter for epidural or we use for this catheter. Of course, there's an epidural kit which has a different catheter. I can't imagine that you can put a Foley's catheter in someone's epidural space. Yeah. It's too big, that is too big. Uh, how do you identify a patient has a spinal hematoma? That's a very good question. Let me answer this. Uh, you, if someone has a spinal hematoma, uh, they will have a, um, uh, compression of we I think likely maybe T4, T5, uh, sorry, L4, L5, depending on where the spinal was done. And what usually happens because after you've given spinal, you lose sensation, motor response, uh, motor response below, uh, usually below T4, it can be below T10 or whatever. So after about three to four hours, if you've used uh, a long acting drug like Vipivacaine, you expect that the patient will, will have motor, motor response. But if you find that, that after six hours, um, the patient still has, uh, has uh, no motor response, then uh, he can't move his lower limbs, then you know that he may be having a spinal hematoma. Of course, it's a, uh, the diagnostic test that will diagnose it will be you can do a CT scan. Uh, the the an MRI would probably be the imaging modality of choice if you have it available. But clinical signs you can detect it. No motor response. Uh, if it's for six hours after spinal, then uh, it's it's likely to be a spinal hematoma. Okay, and that's the reason why we have when someone has low platelets, uh, we don't give a spinal. You risk spinal hematoma. Um, I still haven't understood the difference between spinal anesthesia and epidural. So that's um, um, epidural is put, uh, epidural and uh, spinal anesthesia, you're uh, putting the local anesthetic in the subarachnoid space. Epidural anesthesia, you're putting the local anesthetic in the epidural space. I think that would be the biggest difference. Maybe just from the notes, let's see. Um, uh, let me just show you from this picture. So epidural, we are putting the local anesthetic in this space, okay? Um, Doctor, you're not seeing your screen. Eh? Hey, you're not seeing my screen, okay. Uh, wait a minute. So, um, so we are saying, uh, so epidural, you're putting the local anesthetic in this space and subarachnoid, you're putting the local anesthetic in this space where even you can see the nerve roots are moving. So that's the biggest difference. So if you're putting the local anesthetic directly where the nerve roots are, expect it to work very fast, okay? and uh, very effective, but epidural, it has a lot of, it takes quite some time to work. So the difference is that you're putting here in the epidural space and here you're putting in the subarachnoid space. And um, when you put in the epidural space, it means not a lot of local anesthetic goes uh, deeper. That means you can only get, you get sensory uh, blockage, but you not get the motor blockage and the sympathetic blockage that you get in subarachnoid, when you put in the subarachnoid space. So it explains why you not get motor blockage uh, during an epidural and the patient can be able to walk versus uh, a subarachnoid, uh, versus uh, when you do a spinal anesthesia. Okay, so do we have, um, let's see. Mm. 
N. Yeah, guys, have put their hands up. Okay, let, let's see. Let me just see. Yes, ah, N. Yes, who who wants to? Let's have yes, Jonathan. What do you have to see? Okay, uh, thank you so much. This is Jonathan Mulunji. I have just two questions. One, yeah. can protection be given for a pregnant woman? That is before during pregnancy, even before. Uh -huh. Can flexin, low molecular weight heparin, can it still be given for a pregnant woman during, during pregnancy as prophylaxis uh, in COVID-19 against, uh, let's say, DVT because then hypercoagulability states, or it could be an, um, an a contraindication because probably might, might tip to, to lysis later on during a season. Then uh, that would be my first question. The my other question is, are there particular guidelines for working on COVID-19 mothers, especially in relation to anesthesia? and management thank you um okay uh, that's a, that's a very interesting uh question uh can flexin be used in pregnancy especially to those patients with covid19 now i have to say that covid19 and pregnancy uh, is a very tough position actually the mortality is very high in uh for women who have covid19 and pregnancy i would advise that if you're pregnant don't get covid19 or oh, 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 the other way around, don't get pregnant in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, uh, Clexen, we are, by default, we are giving Clexen to all our COVID-19 patients. Now, Clexen, as you know, is heparin, and it's, um, uh, it's a low molecular uh, weight heparin, okay? And uh, it's, it's fractionated. So we have unfractionated heparin, and then uh, fractionated, which is uh, which is the clexane. It works uh, mostly on uh, by inhibiting factor two. Okay, so it actually it is uh, working on the second uh, on the on the coagulation casket. Now it's um, very challenging to do a cesarean section when someone has had uh, um, uh, has had uh, clexane. So you need at least twelve hours for it to wear out. So what we do in our setting is to change instead from clexin to unfractionated heparin, which is short acting. It lasts about eight hours. And we stop the heparin eight hours before the cesarean section. That's what we do. I, I, I know this is, this is beyond, I, I think this question is beyond uh, what we should discuss because COVID-19 and pregnancy, there are so many things that we think about. But anyway, to answer you is that clexin would stop the clexin and would give unfractionated Heparin, which is short acting, which will give it eight hour, every eight hours until eight hours before the actual cesarean section would stop the the, uh, the unfractionated heparin, and then would restart it after the cesarean section. And once the patient is stable and uh, no longer at risk of bleeding, um, so uh, you asked something about. I think that was it. COVID nineteen and yeah, and other particular. As, a, as for my case, I'm at the COVID treatment unit. So I've mm. seen some mothers, of course, dying of COVID. Mm. The pregnant women, that is why I was interested in particular guidelines if they have yet been stipulated, especially when, for, when you have critically ill patients, those are patients probably saturating at 60% or all probably less than 80%, and those probably may need to have an emergency scissor, so cesarean section. So I was wondering, are there particular guidelines which have already been stipulated by Ministry of Health or particular guidelines? Yeah. Which, we are not having uh, set guidelines, but of course, uh, people are working on it. But um, what you have said, uh, since you're working in the COVID unit, you know how dangerous uh, pregnancy and COVID is. So, yes, I do. yeah, but we've managed to save a few mothers, but we have lost also uh, some mothers along the way. Uh, the, prot the protocol is to make sure that. Uh, uh, the mother is on uh, heparin until eight hours before the procedure. Uh, of course, the staff that is working on the patient have to be um, have to be well protected. If you are going to do general anesthesia, you have to make sure that uh, um, you have an N95 mask yeah. because of course that will be direct inoculation uh, into your so, uh, yeah. so so. The management doesn't change, but uh, the preferred is final, especially if the um, 
the lab work workout is okay. Protection of the of the staff that is around, and then also making sure that uh, uh, the patient is getting uh, good oxygenation. Okay, like good oxygenation. Yeah. If someone was saturating thirty five, by the time he comes to theater, he'd have a uh, you'd be having a tube in and uh, receiving 100% oxygen uh, in that case. And then we also always try to damper that down using low doses of all the, of, of the general anesthesia drugs that we're going to use. Uh, preferably in this case, we'd use maybe ketamine. I think you've talked about drugs of induction. I don't want to preempt that. Yeah, but it's really a very uh, difficult uh, position to be in to be pregnant and also to have COVID 19. Okay. Yeah. Thank Any you so much. Questions? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. You're welcome. Yes. Let's. Uh, uh, can you just write down the questions so that we, uh, we move faster? Yes, Alan. Uh-huh, I can't hear the question. You can either write it down or you can uh, you can just speak it. Under which comes the I cannot, I cannot hear. Is it possible to just write the, the question down so that I can? Hey, just. Yes, uh, Joseph has asked a, a question. I think Alan, you need to write down uh, that question. Just write it down. Uh, CSF is always flowing. What stops it from reaching the brain, Oris? There's nothing that stops CSF from reaching the the brain. Uh, but if you have noticed that when we when we are adjusting the. Um, uh, when we are when we are we adjust the bed to make sure that uh, the CSF, the one that has got mixed with the, the local anesthetic, doesn't go up. If it goes up beyond T4, then you have a high spinal, and if it involves the whole spinal cord and brain stem, then it's a total spinal. Okay, I think we are done here. Um, Okay, I'm seeing a question. I've encountered a case where there is a paradox correspondence. Mm -hmm. How does epidural analgesia? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, epidural analgesia has no effect on delivery outcome, but it has uh, an effect on the duration of the labor. It increases labor by one hour. This is uh, by one hour so no no no, no. it increases the it, it delays uh, the second stage by one hour but it has no effect or completely on the on the baby or maternal in fact the, the maternal and uh, and fetal outcome is better under epidural than without an epidural or is and that's the one of the reasons actually if you've noticed that uh, we have cesarean section rates of over 30 percent Yet in developed countries, we have 15% uh, or less. Uh, it's because of good labor analgesia. When there you have an epidural, uh, maternal and fetal outcome will always be much better. Okay. Uh, yes, if someone has um, if someone has an epidural, you can actually uh, still use it for cesarean section. Uh, and that's what you call combined spine. So we can combine the spine and epidural. Uh, OK. I think um, we are going to end there. Dr. Andrew. Yes, yeah. Dr. Andrew. 
Yes. I have just one more question. Uh, I've seen someone, a patient who had a cardiac arrest yes. and was on rotating on obstetric surgery. And uh, the suspicion at that time was a high spinal. So yes. my question in relation to such a scenario is uh, when someone has a cardiac arrest, will that one be totally, will that one, will that one be confirmed at total spinal or you can still have actually a cardiac arrest in a high spinal? Thank you. No, no. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. I just mentioned it, but let me just repeat it and say that uh, um, usually when the patient deteriorates, it's either two things, high spinal uh, or severe hypertension. More, majority of the time it's severe hypertension and it's erroneously told, uh, the people say that he has had high spinal when someone has had severe hypertension. Now the challenge with that is that if someone has high spinal, and uh, you say that he has severe hypertension, uh, it's a problem because if he has high spinal, you need to intubate and secure the air and make sure that the patient is breathing. But if he has severe hypertension and uh, you intubate him, that's not enough because you need to give us suppressors to increase the blood pressure. So it's important to know what, um, what the problem is. Probably when people get severe hypertension, they are likely to die because the people, the first reaction most people do is to intubate the patient. But the first reaction is to find out, uh, does he have a high spinal? Someone with a high spinal, you can, an easy test is to ask them to hold your hand. If they can't squeeze your hand, then that means they most likely have a high spinal. Okay, uh, so. Uh, Dr. Henry, just, uh, the patient was later on, he was, uh, when she got a cardiac arrest, she also had, uh, the BP is actually very low. So the, the, we had to intubate, the patient had to be intubated at the time. It was around 6 a.m. at the end of uh, the night shift. And uh, later on, she was in ICU for about three weeks and recovered well, then had to undergo physiotherapy. And was, she's now- was, was the patient okay before? Uh, the patient was okay. She's around 23 years, yes. Yes, so the reason why they had to take her to ICU, I don't yes. know the whole detail, but that patient got severe hypertension and was wrongly diagnosed as high spinal in this case. Okay, if you have severe hypertension and uh, you immediately reverse the severe hypertension, the patient will wake up and you will walk out of, of theater with no problem. So because they, the first reaction was to intubate, they delayed uh, treating the hypertension and uh, maybe got brain hypoperfusion and then the patient eventually had to go to ICU. So that's why I'm saying uh, the first thing is to make a diagnosis. Are we dealing with hypertension? Are we dealing with high spinal? Probably that patient had severe hypertension rather than high spinal. Probably. Thank you so much, Peter. God.